So I'm going to follow on to Bill's talk and talk to you a little bit about some of the data around STEMI DTU as a clinical trial program, and more specifically, some of the data around the DTU pilot per protocol analysis. So this is a classic EKG that we see. This is the anterior ST elevation MI. These are tombstones that we see on the electrocardiogram that really signify a massive injury current that's going through a patient's heart. This patient was a 70-year-old, vibrant, active gentleman who started to develop chest pain. You can see the electrocardiogram with an, a sum of ST elevation across the precordium greater than 20 millimeters with symptom onset over one hour. The patient gets consented for the STEMI door to unload trial and gets randomized to the control arm of that study, which means they receive standard of care, which is to have the artery opened as quickly as possible. So his left ventricular gram shows an EF of 30%. His LV end diastolic pressure is 35. So you put that in the context of some of the preclinical work you saw this morning. The patient had a symptom to balloon time of 110 minutes and a door to balloon time of less than 25 minutes. That, that's about as optimal as you can possibly get in terms of infarct salvage with re primary reperfusion. And you can see the coronary artery is blocked in the red circle. It's open in the green circle. It's a relatively straightforward intervention. The patient feels great on day three to five. The echo shows improvement in the overall EF. Uh, and the CMR, however, shows a massive anterior scar or my myocardial injury current. And this to me is the disconnect where reperfusion does not equal recovery. And for acute cardiac unloading and the recovery meeting, this is where we are really starting to go against the grain, suggesting that reperfusion alone is not sufficient for trying to achieve optimal myocardial salvage. And so I think you've seen some of these data, but one of the most important things as you go out as ambassadors for ACURE and DTU is to recognize that part of the reason for doing the DTU trial is to start to mitigate the onset of heart failure. And this is really one of the major reasons why we started to drive this forward. This has huge implications if we can reduce the burden of heart failure globally by starting to tackle ischemic heart failure right at its origin, which is at the time of anterior STEMI. 34% of patients will develop in-hospital heart failure. 71% will develop heart failure within five years. That has implications that will go way beyond our own lifetime. So this will change the paradigm for centuries to come. One of the most important things to recognize in this field is that it's not just about the infarct also. The infarct is a multifactorial injury uh, process. So infarct size is one readout, but as was brought up, also microvascular obstruction is a critical component of this injury current. And the microvascular obstruction really occurs due to thrombotic debris, endothelial damage, vasoconstriction, and extrinsic compression of the microvessels due to edema around this penumbra of injury that's occurring during reperfusion. And so both MVO and infarct size are important endpoints to look at, and they're both powered in the DTU pivotal uh, to show whether or not unloading has an impact on microvascular obstruction. So the mechanistic rationale really was born uh, from different laboratories, many of whom are listed here as part of ACURE faculty. And really in parallel to the growth of ACURE, the science has been building every year. And during those two, three years of pandemic experience, the science has only gotten more rigorous, and you're going to see that over the next few years with more data coming out. One of the key aspects of the STEMI D2 trial is this concept of delaying reperfusion. It's radically disruptive to say that you're not going to open up a blocked artery or you're not even going to look at the artery and you, instead you're going to go straight to unloading. And so the science supports that. You've seen the figure on the left, on the bottom left, showing that the 30-minute delay in group three had the lowest infarct size and the smallest standard deviation. It was a very efficient method of reducing infarct size is 30 minutes of unloading before reperfusion. The science is now growing, and it's beginning to go into multiple labs around the world on the bottom right. But I think what's really important is that even to this day, when I talk to interventionalists, I just had another guest speaker at Tufts come and join us from the West Coast. We sat down. We briefly talked about DTU. And he said, well, it's a, it's a negative randomized trial. And I said, you know, this is a really important point, is what are we really asking with the DTU concept? So, of course, for the pilot, it was really about safety and feasibility. Can you do this uh, concept of 30 minutes of unloading? Can you put an impella in the middle of a STEMI? Can you take it out safely? Is that possible without causing harm?
And then the second question was, does delayed reperfusion, this 30 minutes that we saw in the preclinical models, plus LV and loading, does it increase infarct size? As Bill just showed you, the longer the ischemic time, you should be seeing increased infarct size. And so that was the question. And I think we learned a lot about how to talk about DTU based on the 2018 presentation here uh, in Chicago at the AHA. But what are we really asking with DTU? We're not asking, are we going to you know, risk not increasing infarct size. What we're really asking is, does delayed reperfusion for 30 minutes plus LV unloading limit myocardial ischemia? Are we starting to limit ischemic damage and hence reduce myocardial damage? That's a very different way of postulating or posing the hypothesis. And it's very disruptive. Nobody wants to hear that in the green. And I think that's where we have to think about as a team here at ACURE, how do we think about the language of rolling out the concept of DTU? Bill showed the DTU pilot, the design, 25 in each arm. What we saw very early on was that there was great compliance with the 30 minutes of unloading in the blue dots. That was our folks who were randomized to that period. And that was one of the first reassuring signals about feasibility of this concept. But what are we really learning from that pilot? And now in the pivotal, it's becoming more and more apparent. LV unloading and delayed reperfusion reduces ischemic symptoms. And this is now the proverbial impella snore. So for all the D2 trialists who are experiencing the trial, it's important to recognize on the Tiger text you can see on the left, this is a, one of their first enrollments at this site. The patient was randomized to the unload arm. They received an impella, and the text came across, patient fell asleep after impella insertion when they had come in with crushing chest pain. The angiogram is done 30 minutes later. That LED is occluded, and patient is completely chest pain free. And this is the landmark moment which starts to suggest that unloading now starts to change the ischemic pattern. You are no longer ischemic when you're unloaded. And that's the impella snore that we all want you to put out there and basically get people to understand what that means. I think it's also important to recognize that LV unloading and delayed reperfusion uncouples coronary occlusion from myocardial infarct size. And that is actually far more penetrating than just simply myocardial salvage. What we've done now is we've created a window in time which no longer existed. During those 30 minutes, what else can you do to optimize this patient's outcome? Can you combine therapies? Can you think about drug device combinations? Can you think about really what we do in the operating room? Can we think about cardioplegia and other different effects to try to optimize myocardial and metabolic recovery? And so with the DTU Pivotal, we're still seeing very strong compliance with the 30 minutes of unloading. This is now across hundreds of patients. And it's, again, that strong reassuring signal that we have already changed the paradigm of infarct management just by executing the trial. So what happens during that period of unloading and delayed reperfusion? As we said, we created this green bar, this period in time which no longer existed. And prior to that, it was really only two options, ischemia and reperfusion. And those are all the canonical pathways, mitochondrial damage, cardiomyocyte injury. But now we're going to change that, that paradigm to ischemia, unloading, and reperfusion. And what happens during that period of unloading? And we're just scratching the surface on that. And so our lab has shown that from a physiologic perspective, we are starting to see enhanced collateral flow to the area at risk from vessels that are non-culprit targets for LED interior MI. And so as a result, this starts to increase pressure and starts to reduce the area at risk within the infarct zone. And that's enhanced perfusion, the concept of basically um, functional reperfusion without opening the epicardial vessel. But what you're going to see here at ACURE is more and more science coming out that digs in deeper in terms of mechanism. This paper we put out back in 2020, this was during the pandemic, and one of the things we wanted to understand was, are we affecting ischemia? So we used a biomarker of ischemia. This is known as hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha. And HIF-1-alpha is going gonna, is gonna to go up whenever you have hypoxia or tissue ischemia. And what you can see is that as soon as we unload, we start to reduce HIF-1-alpha expression before we even open up the artery. And so that starts to be the molecular readout that we are starting to reduce ischemic burden. And Dr. Swain, who's in my lab, will be presenting some of these findings at her poster and also her oral presentation. But I want to point out one thing that's radically disruptive on this figure. Look at the duration of unloading. 30 minutes was really meant to basically appease the current status quo. This is 120 minutes of unloading with no reperfusion. 
and we are starting to see a shutdown of myocardial ischemia. So what that means is that in the future, as ACURE starts to build, as unloading science starts to build, it may be very possible that you unload your patient for a period of hours before you actually bring them back for the most optimal reperfusion that's going to lead them to a better outcome. So I think this is really what's going to change the paradigm going forward. And I think it's really important because, as we said, we're, we're within the closed inner circle here of ACURE, so I can say things like, maybe there's no rush to open this artery. Maybe once you're unloaded, it's actually better to take your time, and there's maybe 15 other things we should be doing during those hours of unloading. Maybe the paradigm changes, so the Seaport trial, which threw all STEMIs into the community, now says actually what every community hospital needs is to unload and then basically bring the patient to a center where they can get all the other adjuncts and get more optimal outcomes. That may shut down the burden of ischemic heart failure because what we're saying is DTU for 30 minutes is just the beginning. More prolonged LV unloading may be a better approach in a subset of patients. Now, one of the things you're also going to see in Dr. Swain's presentation is a lot of deep science, and really it's very important to have mechanism. You can't be disruptive if you don't have supportive evidence and data to support what you're proposing. And one of the things that we like to do in our lab is we like to do a blinded omics approach. So what you're seeing is a heat map of a number of different metabolites in the infarct area at risk. And if you look at the sham group, you can see the typical pattern in the upper part uh, where you can see that there's sort of red, yellow, and green mixed. During occlusion, you still see the red, yellow, and green mixed, and that's without unloading. But as soon as you unload during a period of occlusion, look at the color change. All the things that were yellow and red now go green. All the things that were down in the period of sham, which were red at the bottom of that heat map, they stay red. So there is a significant metabolic shift of unloading before you even reperfuse. And the nice thing about this is that this is an unbiased, computerized hierarchical clustering of metabolites. It has no influence based on the scientists, and that really adds a lot of credence. What you see on the right side here is something very important as well. In the blue bar, this is the group that had occlusion without unloading, and in the hashed orange bar, you can see the effect of unloading. We're starting to shut down anaerobic glycolysis, and that's a critical mechanism for reperfusion injury. With, with anaerobic glycolysis, you start to drive and feed forward uh, massive amounts of myocardial damage. So by shutting that down during the ischemic period, that allows the heart to no longer recognize that it is ischemic. This is the metabolic molecular version of impella snore, and that really is an important mechanism to explain as we go forward. So this is one that this is a, a figure that I have in my head almost 24/7. So STEMI Dordogne is just the beginning, and really what everyone wants you to do is stay inside the box. Please think inside me. But at Acure, you and I are way outside the box. And that's where we should be, because that's where a lot of the disruption is going to come forward. So I'm excited for the future. When we look at the pilot data, we broke it down into a per-protocol analysis, and we took out, we learned a lot of lessons. The first thing we learned from the pilot is that 36% of DTU pilot patients didn't even adhere to the study protocol. That tells you that it's difficult to execute this trial. And one of the things that we're learning now in the pivotal is that DTU trial execution requires a community for 24-7 access to support this trial execution so we have complete adherence. There's our STEMI D2 investigators at the recent summit, and you can see the on-call schedule in the bottom right for all of the investigators to help each other in this community that now is on Tiger Connect. What happens in the trial is basically everybody gets the femoral angiogram, everyone gets a V-gram, it's not transmitting 100%, but the idea is that we are vetting each and every patient to make sure we're getting high quality enrollments. Average ST elevation in the pivotal is eight millimeters. The, uh, the patients are actually accruing in into the right group for this trial. And if we stay per protocol, based on the pilot analysis, what we're starting to see is that in the blue bars on load and delayed reperfusion, compared to the red bars of unloading and, re and immediate reperfusion, irrespective of the size of the anterior MI, you're going to have a benefit with unloading and delayed reperfusion. And that's across the board. Both arms are unloaded, but the only difference between these two arms is the 30 minutes of conditioning. And that's why it's really important to have the science to drive that forward. 
Bill showed some of these data in terms of comparing it to some standard metrics. I think it's important to recognize that the CRISP AMI trial had an average three to five day infarct size total normalized to total LV mass of around 36 percent. So the mean that Bill showed of around 20 to 25 percent in the trial suggests that we're starting to get into that unloaded range. And when the when of course we can break the random randomization, we'll have a good sense of that. But we're not seeing these massive infarcts as the mean in the DTU puzzle, and I think that's basically the influence of unloading. Microvascular obstruction we talked about, and this is critically important. The cutoff value for is 2.6% to show a difference in terms of long-term outcomes for patients. With unload and delayed reperfusion, we're around 1.3 to 1.6%. That is about one of the smallest MVOs you'll see in any clinical trial. And what you can see is that in CRISP AMI, where they use balloon pump or nothing, there you're starting to see 3.1, 4.5. And between the blue and the red, that's all about myocardial conditioning for 30 minutes. That's the big delta between those two arms. So the D2 Pivotal trial design has now been published. We have about 250 patients enrolled in the Pivotal, as you heard. So this is moving forward very quickly. I think it's important to keep this image in mind. As Bill pointed out, CMR is not something we see commonly, but we can do better for these patients. And I think this is where this field is now going to accelerate as we start to go into recover for and start to think about pre-PCI impella support for patients with AMI and cardiogenic shock. That's the next wave for STEMI D2 development. So congratulations to everybody here at ACURE. We're thrilled to be back in person. We're looking forward to ACURE 2023 already. And this science is really built by this team here today. So thanks very much for your attention.